Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. I understand there are over 700 of you registered for tonight's program. That is tremendously exciting. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters for the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We're so grateful to have this opportunity to explore Lady Bird Johnson's role in depth with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm so pleased to extend a warm virtual welcome back to the library to Dr. Julia Swig. Dr. Swig is an award-winning author of books on Cuba, Latin America, and American foreign policy, whose writing has appeared in numerous national publications. She served as senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations for 15 years and concurrently led the Aspen Institute's Congressional Seminar on Latin America for 10 years. She is a non-resident senior research fellow at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Her new book, which I've heard great things about, is Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight. I'm also delighted to welcome back to the library, Dr. Ellen Fitzpatrick, Professor of History at the University of New Hampshire to moderate tonight's discussion a professor and scholar of modern American political and intellectual history. She is the author and editor of eight books, including Letters to Jackie, Condolences from a Grieving Nation, and The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for the American Presidency. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm delighted to be here and to have a chance to talk to Julia about this amazing book you've written. I learned so much from reading it. It was absolutely fascinating. And I have a lot of questions for you as I'm sure our audience will have as well. I wondered um, if you could start by telling us a little bit how you found your way to Lady Bird Johnson, which isn't obvious from reading your uh, CV or your a uh, short bio that your book provides. You've had a really interesting career um, and looks like you know a lot about Latin America. And um, I'm wondering you know, about how you came to Lady Bird and your decision to write this book. Well, um, I love your opening question and it is one that deserves an answer, but I wanna just thank you, Alan, for, for agreeing to do this and, and um, take a detour from finishing your semester with your students in order to, to read the book and, and be with me here tonight. It's a great honor. And to my uh, friends at the Kennedy Library, thanks so much for having me here with you and, and to everybody for coming. You know, I um, had spent 15 years working in foreign policy and mainly focusing on Latin America, often on Cuba and did that living in Washington DC and traveling all over the region. And very often, I, there were two real components that led me to Lady Bird. One is I was very often the only woman in the room. And this kind of made, brought a certain marination in my mind that I wanted to try to get myself the time to think more broadly about the topic of women and power, something that you know about yourself. That was one thing. The second is that I just wanted to teach myself something new. I felt that I had really spent a good long time reading and writing and traveling and being a practitioner on foreign policy in Latin America. And I wanted to find a vehicle to allow me to talk and think and pursue some scholarship as a public intellectual about American politics and history, not just Latin American politics and history. And I didn't have Lady Bird specifically in mind initially. I had the, the general topic of women in power, but then I uh, learned that Lady Bird had kept a diary while she was in the White House. And of course, Lady Bird Johnson is the, 
the individual married to another individual most associated, at least in the 20th century with the word power. So once I read initially her published transcripts and then began listening to her audio diary and reading all of the secondary literature on Johnson, it, it just answered the question for me. This was the topic and especially seeing how little the material that she had left and the material about her in the archives from her own time in the White House had made it into the historiography. Well, that just sealed the deal. Well, I have to ask you, um, because I'm envious, I have title envy. This is <laughs> such a brilliant title, such a brilliant ah. title hiding in plain sight. How did you come to it? Did, did someone else have a good idea or is it yours or it so perfectly captures, it seems to me, what you did in this book. Um, I won't say more because then I'll give my own answer. Tell me how you came okay, up with this okay. great title. Well, no, I mean, I did come up with the title. It, it was staring at me in the face and it's for two reasons. One is because Lady Bird Johnson herself is her, we think we know who she is or we thought we did. And yet here she was staring at us, hiding in plain sight. Her story um, was one of kind of a two dimensional person really. But in fact, the historical material, the source material to show us what a, a far richer, more multi-dimensional person she was, was also hiding in plain sight in the LBJ library and not just her audio tapes, but a vast amount of material that really puts meat on the bone of, of that two dimensionality mixing metaphors here. But um, so, so it just kind of, it, it made itself manifest that that was both, that that had to be the subtitle of the book. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful because it, it so well captures um, both points that you just made that I think that most um, Americans of a certain age, myself included, who lived through the 60s, think that they know her. They have an impression of Lady Bird and I think overall quite a positive one. Um, and yet, um, you know, when one finishes your book, you one realizes how little we did know, how much was really out of sight how superficial our understanding was of her, at least mine, I'll confess to it. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, um, the purposefulness that she brought to ensuring that although she and her husband might not be appreciated or well understood in their own time, that eventually another generation would look back and see their time in office differently. Yes, I, I really admire that aspect of her. And, and I'll tell, you know this, but I'll tell those of you that have signed on to listen to our, us talk tonight, which is that she was a history major and a journalism major. And she had really in her bones this commitment to documenting and understood the importance. She understood the lags in history, I think, but especially as she got deeper and deeper into her political career, their political career together, and certainly once they entered the White House, I think she understood, you could see it because she started preparing to create the LBJ library and to collect material and record these audio diaries starting eight days after the JFK assassination. And then within a matter of, I would say before even the beginning of 65, she understood exactly your point that it was gonna take a while to have a full appreciation of this of the presidency because of Vietnam, essentially. Uh, there, I have to interject there that in your uh, to tell you this anecdote, which is uh, I was stunned to come across your discussion of the women doers lunches that she had, where she would bring these esteemed and accomplished women to the White House and. Um, someone would give a presentation and one of the early ones, maybe the first, 
uh, with someone who was a mentor of mine, Barbara Miller Solomon. Oh. And um, it brought back to me my conversation with Barbara, who died m many years ago, um, in which she told me about going to the White House and how much she admired Lady Bird. Barbara was, uh, for our uh, our other guest tonight was the head of the uh, what was then the Women's Archives at Harvard, and um, also taught at Harvard in the history of American civilization. But she, uh, the Women's Archives, eventually became the Schlesinger Library on the history of women. Um, and so Barbara was an early guest, and you recount her making an impression on Lady Bird when she said to the other women at this luncheon save your letters, save your diaries. This is the stuff of women's history. And, yes, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so touched that, that that makes this moment even more special, Ellen, and the fact that she was your mentor. And the fact that she was the first person Lady, invite, Lady Bird invited to speak at the White House and gave that message. Lady Bird had already started to keep her audio recordings but I think that helped seal the deal about the significance for the long term in as far as the telling of the history of the Johnson presidency and as far as the importance for women, especially of that time, to see their to 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 value their own stories, right? And that's what mm -hmm. this act of recording this diary was for Lady Bird. It was a significant sign that she valued her participation, not just her observations, but her participation in that presidency. So that's, that's amazing that she was your mentor. I love she that. Was a, she was a wonderful person and she was a very, um, a very uh, I think, uh, perceptive judge of character. And she was, you know, she loved Lady Bird. She had nothing but positives to say about her. I want to ask you about this amazing source that stands at the center of your book, the diaries, which have their own history. I wasn't sure actually whether, were these um, just dictated? Did she have anything that she wrote and then read into a tape or was no. it all just? No, I'll, I'll tell you how she produced them and the short answer and then I'll give the long answer. She recorded her voice first and that was then transcribed. Okay. But what's so impressive about her is that her first draft was so good. She would sit and, and remember, this is a woman who's operating like the CEO of the White House. She's yeah. got her hands in so many things, her public role, her private role, her kids, her husband, her policy issues. And she finds a way to record 123 hours over the course of five years. It's 1,750,000 words. Wow. So she would take a, a manila envelope that her staff put together for every day. And in that envelope was his daily diary, her daily diary, press clips, various ephemera, seating charts for the state dinners, memos, all kinds of material. And she would sit, and this was her this was her very brilliant mind and capacity for synthesis. She'd read it all, turn on the recorder, and then dictate in almost always cogent, perfectly composed sentences and paragraphs. And that's how she did it. And she started, and she very seldom rewound and re-recorded. What was done was done, right? She was, she was very disciplined about it and obviously very confident. And so the material itself reads really well. Often it's very beautiful, especially when she's writing about nature. Her studies of character are sharp-witted. She goes from the sublime to the silly in just a nanosecond. There's just a lot of material in there. And then of course, there's the rich material about major decisions in the White House that her husband is making and their discussions about those, all kinds of things. So that's, that's how it's done, recording and then transcribed. Now, there was also the mind numbing material as well, I assume, right? Like who yes. sat where, a which state dinner and what? Um, well, how... I was, that's true. There's a lot of that. <laughs> There's a lot of the social stuff. There's a lot of the discussion of, you know, when she's getting ready to, to when she's organizing two weddings, 
for her daughters. There's a lot of wedding planning. There's a lot of the material that you would associate if one isn't a, you know, the, that kind of two dimensionality of, well, what do first ladies do? They do the social stuff and they do the ceremonial stuff. All of that is in there and it can be a bit eye glazing, but the nuggets of gold so far outweigh that to my mind. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to stick with this, but she well, does have, she does. I mean, I, I, a friend of mine and I live in Washington DC kind of criticized me for saying that the seating charts and who's sitting where was mind numbing because he said, you know, that's the ultimate power to decide right. who's sitting next to whom. So I, I have to have more respect for that than I might have at the beginning. Well, this is where your readers are advantaged by the fact that we have you who went through all of this and you picked out the great stuff and you've put it all into this uh, wonderful narrative. I wondered, um, the diary has its own Thank history. You. Some of it published um, when both of the Johnsons were still alive as the White House diary. This was a redacted version that came out in 1970. And then uh, you tell us that uh, six years after her death in 2007, the LBJ library began to release more of the diary, the transcripts make more of this accessible. I wondered if the diary is entirely released now, um, is it entirely unredacted now? And um, I wondered too about the, what was left out in the version that she was able that that she had some control over. Right. So yes, it is now all released and anybody can go onto the LBJ Library's website and you can listen to the audio of every single entry wow. and see the transcript right there. And what you can also see in the way they've digitized the um, the hard copy of the transcript is that beginning since she published in 1970, the first volume, and it was un, it was redacted, but it was still 780 pages. Um, she went through because a lot of the transcribers couldn't understand her accent so well, so she corrected some of the words and made some small grammatical changes. In some cases, when you can also see this now that they've released the full unredacted versions, she did in very few cases mark some material closed for 10 years and then review. And there's a, a particular instance in the book that we can talk about that's very interesting and very surprising. Well, not surprising, but very, very, um, it's the only place I've seen it reported um, where she does that. But generally it's all there. It ended, she stopped recording on January 31st, 1969. So the, all of the material is now available. Did I, you answered, asked three questions. Was there a third yes, I didn't you, answer? I think you covered it. Um, okay. But maybe you have to tell me now, what was the- Okay, you know, I'll tell you now. Come on, I, I can't wait for these secrets to be revealed. I'm on no, the edge no, of no, my I'll, seat. No, 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 I'll tell you now. But so, so the, we, one of the themes in the book and the, a theme that we know about Lyndon Johnson has to do with his, emotional volatility and his depression. Mm -hmm. She writes about his depression throughout okay. the time that they're in the White House. We also know, and there's some new material in the book that puts a lot of, that really develops this, that she was a very significant influence on the way he entered the White House. I'm not talking about the assassination, but I'm talking about the transition that she and Jackie orchestrated. Right. But also in the early months of 1964, he had a lot of trepidation about whether mm -hmm. he was going to even run in, later in 64, we can come back to that. And then of course, she has a major role in orchestrating his exit in 1968. Yeah. But in October of 1965, and I, I assume from this that there must have been other moments that she didn't record about it, although that could be incorrect. When he goes into the Bethesda Naval Hospital for his gallbladder surgery, yeah. he's checked into the hospital for two weeks and she moves in with him. And he's, it's a long surgery, but his convalescence is going okay. And one day she leaves to go spend the day at the White House. They've had tea balls and melon for breakfast. And by the way, I absolutely love the detail she provides. Mm -hmm. um, and she comes back and she walks into, and it's dusk. 
in October. So you can imagine the light. And she walks into his uh, hospital room and he's sitting there with Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas, their longtime advisor, who by now is a, a Supreme Court Associate Justice. And Lyndon is telling him that he'd like to resign and that he wants right. to dictate his resignation statements yes. to Abe, which he does. The only documentation that I've found, because I looked, of this moment of LBJ's, obviously his post-operative depression, but just his feeling so crushed by the weight of, the, of being president. The only place I've seen that documented is by Lady Bird. Yeah, uh, the, these are, this is really important um, uh, what you just said, because it, it really, um, for me, because it's a segue into some of the, I've asked you, I have 15 questions and I've asked you one, two, three. Uh oh. Okay. Well, I <laughs> I, I've got to pick better, up the yeah, pace I better, here. <laughs> I, I better answer more concisely. <laughs> no, it's not you. It's me. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm leading you into uh, the substance of your book, and you've you've opened um, several questions in a row that I wanted to to ask you. Um, it seems appropriate, you know, to begin with the circumstances that brought. Uh, the Johnsons into the White House. Um, her diary starts with the entry on November 22nd, 19, about November 22nd, 1963, that's taped just eight days after the Kennedy assassination. And it was no secret that the vice presidency hadn't been an entirely happy period in LBJ's political life. But I wondered if you would say a few words about, which I found so interesting in the book, the relationship between the two couples, the Kennedys and the Johnsons, prior to the death of President Kennedy and during uh, the Kennedy White House years, and also how that, you know, this tragic circumstances in which uh, the Johnsons, of course, um, came into the White House and just really two weeks after moving in. Um, to, you know, taking up residence in the White House, it's framed by this national tragedy. But your discussion of the relationship between um, uh, the Kennedys and the Johnson, I thought was very illuminating. And I wondered if you could speak to that a bit. Yes, and um, I think my connection is somewhat unstable. I just want to make sure that you can hear me. I can, you're breaking up a little bit, but keep okay, going. Okay, I apologize. The, I'll, I'll just go back I'll just to say that in the 1950s, especially when Jackie and Jack came to Washington, they were married in 1953. By 1955, LBJ is the Senate majority leader and that confers upon Lady Bird the, the seniority. Mm -hmm. um, and she's sort of rules the roost among Senate wives in Washington and in the Kabuki theater of Washington, DC, she, she was on top and she was almost 20 years Jackie's senior, made an effort to bring her in and open the door to her. And Jackie wasn't so wild about being a political spouse. She did it, but she wasn't the kind of political animal that Lady Bird was. Right. Um, but, you know, of course, by 1960, the script has flipped. And now with the 1960 convention in Los Angeles, the Kennedys are on top and the Johnsons quite uncomfortably find themselves placed in the position of not being able to say no to the offer to join the ticket as vice president. Totally emasculating for LBJ. Lady Bird doesn't want to do it, but they, they don't see an out. Lady Bird and Jackie and the Johnsons and the Kennedys embark on the 1960 campaign with Jackie staying largely at home. Right. She's dealing with miscarriages, she's pregnant, she's not gonna go out on the rope lines. So Lady Bird steps in as her surrogate, as Lyndon's surrogate, as Jack's surrogate. She travels all through the South with the sisters and with Rose Kennedy. And she's later, of course, credited by Bobby Kennedy as winning Texas for, for the Kennedy Johnson ticket. And, she's continues as second lady to be there and makes herself indispensable. She says yes to all the things that Jackie asks her to do, all the things that Jackie doesn't want to do herself, 
including going to Los Angeles to accept the Emmy Award for the television right. show that Jackie that was... did in the White House, right. which is kind of, you know, <laughs> astonishing. Right. Um, but it just shows, and I think that Lady Bird's ability to make herself indispensable, she learned that with Lyndon and she certainly did it with Jackie. So by the time they get to November 22nd, 1963, Jackie has enormously poignant and loving feelings toward Lady Bird. And, and you can see in the letters before, uh, leading up to 63, when they're in the vice presidency, especially between Jackie and LBJ and Jackie and, and Lady Bird, it's filled, as I write in my book, with X's and O's and sort of inside jokes. And they do seem to have a kind of contented way of being with one another. But when they go to Dallas, at that time, there's a rumor that Jack Kennedy is going to throw Lyndon off the ticket. And they've already looked for an alternative for LBJ. He might become the president of San Marcos College if he loses his place on the ticket. The tension is really thick uh, inside of the Oval Office. And everybody knows about the, the, the derision with which the Kennedy team treated LBJ. Um, but the, the, there was a more of an intimate relationship than I think is known, especially between Jackie and Lady Bird that helped them to get through those, that, those 14 days of transition. Yes, I thought that was really, um, really illuminating. And, and uh, you know, both of the Johnsons were extremely gracious, you know, in this, this terrible period. But even before then, it seemed as if the two couples, you know, got along and the, the, um, the some of the, some of what's been written since. I think your, your book is an important, you know, corrective to some of this. Um, you also uh, begin your book with a real revelation, and that is the ambition that Lady Bird had for her husband in 1964. So they come in into these tragic circumstances. Um, he, Lyndon uh, Johnson is going to fill out JFK's term, but what you, uh, tell us and what Lady Bird told you um, <laughs> is that um, in fact he was deeply ambivalent about even then seeking election on his own. This really upsets the portrait of LBJ as you know um, craven and his thirst for power and with this overweening political ambition. Uh, on the other hand, we have Lady Bird saying, you know, trying to persuade him, really, um, it seemed to me, <laughs> that, come on, this is your moment, and you can't back out now. Um, and that, I thought, was really, really fascinating. Can you say a little bit about, um, about I think in some ways, um, this frames your whole book when we learn from the get-go that he's not as into it as <laughs> reported and she's, she's got ambitions. Yeah, at first I thought I would title the book Lady Bird's Ambition or Bird's <laughs> Ambition because that is the word that screams out from this material. And what, what Ellen, what you're talking about is the document that was sitting in the LBJ library in a folder called Letters, Mrs. Johnson to President Johnson. And it's, but the document, I took the liberty of renaming it without the National Archives permission. And I now call it the Huntland Strategy Memo. Yes. And it's, a, and I, I wanted to use the word strategy and I wanted to use the word memo because the word letter is this kind of feminized word, but you know, senior advisors in the White House write strategy memos to the president. And Lady Bird Johnson to me is a senior advisor to the White House writing a strategy memo to the president who she's married to. He in May of 1964 is looking down the horizon as she is. Now this is when civil rights is still stuck in the Congress. The war on poverty legislation hasn't passed. Uh, the Kennedy War Council, who he's kept on board, is pushing for escalation in Vietnam. They don't feel solid in their 
impact on their as solid on foreign policy as they do on domestic. By they, I mean the Johnsons. And he is looking ahead at the election and then afterward and wondering if he can unify the country, wondering how much momentum between November 63 and over the course of 64, he's going to be able to gather in order to make the case for a sustained and successful presidency. And he's miserable. He even has a toothache and he calls her this toothache as a metaphor, right? She's out at Huntland, which is a, a, an estate in Middleburg, Virginia. The reason why she's there is another story, but he calls her and they speak as they do on the phone all the time when they're not together. And he asks her to write out her analysis of the pros and cons of running or not running. And that's what that document is. And that's what the, the prologue of the book lays out. And it shows her laying out the case. As you say, she says, you're not ready to step out of the arena. And if you do, and we go back to the ranch, you're gonna be miserable. And I don't wanna live with you if you're miserable. You're too young. And what you should do is you'll run and you'll very likely win. And then we'll work our hardest for three years with all the slings and arrows that will come. But in February or March of 1968, you can tell the world that you won't be standing for a second term, which of course, we know is exactly what he did on March 31st, 1968, which was a decision that came as a huge surprise to everybody but the two of them. This is like a, a really big deal, it seems to me, <laughs> what you have, what you offer here, because um, that was going to be my next question was about the Huntland strategy. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I, I can No, no, okay. you're doing a great job of anticipating these things. Um, in part because when I meant, when I referred to her ambition, this is not, you know, what, what others have accused uh, Hillary Clinton of, I think, you know, uh, you know, in an exaggerated way that somehow she was scheming to do augment her own power or something um, from the get-go and saw herself as her husband's successor. On the contrary, um, what and, and the charges of ambition being a negative thing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. uh, uh, the wife of a president to have, the ambition was really for her husband's um, capacities that she believed in and what she thought as a moment that they shared that they could really accomplish some important things for the country. And so um, that's the other shoe that drops though in the Huntland strategy memo. It's right there at the beginning that it may well be a one term presidency. That right. is once he's elected on his own, you know, um, they're already anticipating then what will eventually happen that she's like, you got to do this now, but then you can stop, as you said. And that I think is a real news to um, uh, uh, people that live through um, seeing Johnson give his speech on March in March of 1968, when he withdrew the, the normal accounts are that he was forced out by the anti-war movement, the failures in the war by his dwindling popularity, the upheaval in the Democratic Party. And here you have this other side of Lyndon Johnson that's being shown and her role really um, in, you know, sort of setting a time frame to it. That was fascinating, I thought. Well done. Well, thank you. And I mean, I feel that I, I thought it was a, a bit of a, a mind blow as well, mm -hmm. especially, and you can imagine this, I don't know how many times I went back and read and reread all of the other secondary literature to make sure that I hadn't missed that somebody else had already picked it up. And what had been picked up and is, gets a lot more attention is that in August of 64, right before the Democratic Party convention, he has another moment of freak out where he gets panicked and sits down and writes out his own resignation statement and calls Lady Bird and Walter Jenkins reads it. To, that's well much more known, but the much earlier time of May of 64, I, I found one or two people mention it, but kind of in passing and never connecting it 
to what happened in March of 1968, which well, as you say, was digested at the time as Bobby Kennedy and Jean McCarthy and Vietnam and, and the kind of shock that anybody, not least Lyndon Johnson, would step away from power. Lady Bird was the only person, I, I watched an interview she did with Ted Koppel in 1997, and she is trying to explain to him and he pushes back, he can't fathom it. She says, I'm probably the only one that believes truly that LBJ really didn't want to be president. And now of course he did want to be president, but the major trepidation and insecurity that he had was, I think, impossible to understand without Lady Bird. And your point about without her, without her role in the presidency being illuminated, you're right about it, the ambition that she had for him, for him as opposed to for herself. But she also, you know, their 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 jointness of their commingled mm -hmm. political enterprise was so developed by 1964. Yes that I, I, I think that she was very excited about what they were potentially going to be able to do for the country, they, right. not just he. Yes, and I think, um, you know, I think you say somewhere early in the book that uh, you really can't know one of them without the other, that their lives were intertwined so early and their political ideas, their commitments, their values, um, you know, I think um, it's just extremely illuminating in part because she turned out to be a person of such great substance. It's a much more complicated story than Wilson has a stroke, Edith Wilson plays this particular role, or Nancy Reagan is whispering things in Ronald Reagan's ear. This is a whole different model here that you are describing and one that I think really has been heretofore unknown about her. Um, I was struck by the fact that amazingly, Johnson from the get-go felt trapped by the war in Vietnam. I'm going to ask you more about this in a minute, but even before the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, in August, which was uh, passed in August of 64, um, and well before the first deployment of combat troops, um, rather than the so-called advisors who we know were doing more than advising, um, he is really in December when he's make, of 1963, when he's first in the White House and having to make decisions about the war, um, Lady Bird is already predicting the toll that this is going to take. And he is very, very vexed by it. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that was extremely interesting how early he felt he had only one way forward towards escalation and how for all of her other um, all of her other remarkable influences on him, she was at one with him on that point. She was until she wasn't. And, and it, take, it, it takes too long for them and for her to get there. I mean, I say that in hindsight, but one of the reasons that I think she was, so, so they're framing, they're thinking about Vietnam was very much that they were children of World War II. And the geopolitical conflict with the communists was key. And one aspect of that geopolitical conflict, whether with the fascists or the communists, is that you don't betray an ally. So as corrupt as Saigon was in South Vietnam, the idea that somehow America will turn its back, let those dominoes fall, it sounds all kind of cliche and hard to believe that the thinking was that facile, but it was very much in their bones. Yes. The second piece of Vietnam, I think for them that kept those blinders on has to do with American exceptionalism and with their Wilsonian notion that we can take our model and watch it succeed halfway around the world. So if we can bring development and electricity to Texas, 
to West Texas, why not to the Mekong Delta? So she, she, she really bought into to those two framings. Um, and then the third thing was they weren't, their foreign policy chops were pretty limited by comparison to the, the, the Camelot guys that stuck around. And between December 63 and May of 64, when she wrote that memo, where she writes also in her diary about the way Vietnam is going to give him such pain. McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, goes to Vietnam five times. And each time he comes back, pressing LBJ, pressing LBJ, pressing LBJ. And I think, you know, there's recordings where you hear him say that he, he doesn't actually see, he knows that he's walking into trouble, knows it's gonna derail him, doesn't know how to not get there, not how to not do it. Yeah, it seemed as if in that sense, their shared ambition created a kind of blinders um, in which um, uh, they were also, I think McNamara's role for them was, seemed very critical. You know, you describe how upset they were when he left the White House and what a, you know, that that was a dark moment anyway in the country and, um, and uh, seeing him bailing, um, you know, must have been, must have been very difficult. The other person, Ellen, if I could just say that was very, that they really admired, she really admired was Bundy. And mm -hmm. Bundy left the White House much earlier than McNamara, but after having really also pushed them to, to stay and to escalate. And, and there's another aspect which actually ties back to LBJ's depression, which I think we all know people who suffer from depression often can get out of their depression through action and momentum. And sometimes I have the feeling that, that Lady Bird, who was around for a lot of the discussions about Vietnam, but not steeped in the strategic issues either, would push LBJ to make a decision because she knew that he would feel better once he had done so. Yes. Yes. And, and it seemed like he did briefly. And then, you know, right. The inexorable nature of this comes through so powerfully in your book, the Shakespearean tragedy at the, that is at the center of this whole story is, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen it conveyed as powerfully as it is conveyed through the lens of, um, of Lady Bird and what you've gleaned from these diaries. Um, Thank we you. have to turn to beautification. Uh, I love the quote when uh, I guess she said it later on, I'll never forgive Lyndon's boys for turning my environmental agenda into a beautification project. But I went ahead and talked about wildflowers so as not to scare anybody because I knew if the people came to love wildflowers, they'd have to eventually care about the land that grew them. And what you portray in the book is a much more complex uh, story about um, Lady Bird's uh, engagement in some sense, really the first sort of, um, you know, person in the White House promoting an environmental agenda from urban planning and also fascinating the degree to which um, they attempted to join this to the great society issues of, uh, you know, not of improving, uh, uh, creating green space, improving urban environments. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit and tell uh, our uh, guests about what she was really doing here, because it was <laughs> a lot more than planting wildflowers on highways. Yes, it certainly was. And I have to tell you that this is the part of the story that most surprised me. Well, there are a lot of surprises, but I also really kind of fell in love with the story behind the story, with what, what was really going on. So um, the beautification, the word beautification, that she's, she made that comment in the night when she was in her 80s. Yeah. Um, never forgiving Lyndon's boys. And it was always a euphemism, one that she really didn't like. And by the 
late, late 67, certainly in the middle of 68, she cast it off definitively. And even her staff would send out, uh, in, would include in memos, like, please don't use the word beautification. We're talking about the environment. We're talking about conservation. Um, she had, as a Washingtonian, not just a Texan, spent 30 years in a city that was a majority black city without congressional representation, without budgetary control, that was highly segregated and where the majority popula black population had little access to nature, even though the National Park Service had vast lands in Washington, DC that it controlled. The parts of Washington that of white Washington had gorgeous Rock Creek Park and um, the Potomac waterfront, which was being developed even back then. Whereas along the Anacostia River in Southwest and Southeast and Northeast, Black Washington, although there is some commingling, I don't wanna oversimplify it. Um, there was very little access to desegregated park space. And she had grown up, she lost her mom when she was five. For her access to nature was a, an essential part of her humanity. And she really believed that Amer that Washington DC could potentially become a model for the rest of the country where, which was dealing with the ravages of urban renewal. There were something like 300 more cities in the country in, in the, that in the forties and fifties where urban renewal projects had bulldozed total neighborhoods, often communities of color. And often those communities wound up in terrible housing complexes, complexes with no parks, that kind of thing. So although in Washington DC and certainly in Texas and with the Highway Beautification Act, she gets associated with this ornamental approach of planting flowers. What she's really trying to do is bring together civil rights and what we would think of as environmental justice today. Um, and so it's a, it's a long story in the book, but what you see is an evolution where she really develops a very, I would even call it a radical vision for putting, to, for putting federal and local money into desegregating park space for local residents and local communities. That's the short end of the stick, but she, uh, of the story, but she puts together a very interesting coalition of civil rights philanthropists and hippie California landscape architects who have some sense of how to mobilize federal resources to that end. And it's very much a great society project, but since it was called beautification, it really got lost in the story of the, of, of, in her story and in the 1960s story. Yeah, and I suppose in some sense trivialized, like, a, yes. you know, this is a woman's first lady's, um, you know, undertaking and appropriate to her sex and her position, but um, not- And to her name, that. and yes. to her name, right? Another euphemism. Um, um, and also I should say, I know we have lots of questions, but she didn't do a great job at articulating the full, the totality of what she was trying to do. You know, she was very cautious about not really stating at the time what she was up to. And that the, the, the flower thing was a good cover, but she failed to give it, the, you know, on the messaging and communication side of it, it, it got very much lost. And so the environmentalists at the time, some of them even missed it. You know, the flower thing though, in and of itself was like a really great thing. <laughs> oh, it's a really great thing. I'm in Washington DC, it's exquisite here, thanks to Well, her. And, and also her, um, you know, uh, these um, um, huge highways that had been, you know, federally funded highway projects built in the 1950s that, you know, were eyesores of people traveling through, now they could travel from state to state, but they'd be seeing these junkyards and huge billboards and, you know, it was her idea to try to seed all this. Right, and I don't think that people understood that we had in Lady Bird in the White House, a woman who was taking on major industry in trying, mm -hmm. to, trying to, to clean up what we saw along highways after all that federal money went into it. Mm 
She was taking on the automobile industry, the junkyard industry, the billboard industry. They were all in cahoots and had no interest in self-regulation. So, so when, when somebody puts up a cartoon that says impeach Lady Bird, the, 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 po the, the politics are pretty strongly against the idea, and it's not Hillary Clinton on healthcare, it's Lady Bird on highways, of a first lady putting herself into the center of the arena and challenging she, the status quo. She really, um, you can see, it seems to me throughout your account, her trying to sort of thread the needle. Of, yes. um, on the one hand, advancing women's issues, issues relating to, and particularly I thought um, uh, the issue of race having grown up in the Jim Crow South and both she and her husband um, strongly, um, you know, uh, taking in really important and uh, important steps, but being careful when she went to Alabama or she was, was mm -hmm. on these uh, various speaking tours um, whether it was over, over issues having to do with the, the country's racial struggles um, when she was in the South, having been from the South, um, or whether it was over the women's issues, both uh, trying to advance uh, what we would see as women's issues, um, but also do it in a way that didn't sound overtly you know, uh, feminist. feminist. Yeah. yeah. Um, it seemed, you know, that she, and part of this, I'm sure, um, or I assume you would agree was generational. Oh, entirely generational. And, and I have a certain amount of respect for what she was able to pull off and how she tried to do it, because I think she was, you know, she was a woman who was born in the beginning of the century who died at the beginning of the following century and in a way you really get a sense about how much of the 1950s how much the 1960s were still the 1950s right mm -hmm. the we we sometimes think i mean you're a historian so i'm not i'm saying that the 1960s were not just all about radicalism and hippie culture and protest and and black power and and the feminist movement there was still a country here that was very conservative. And she had a kind of curated feminism on women's issues, which is to say she wanted to feature and highlight professional women, but she didn't like stridency of any kind. So on the women's issues, she, she as you said, thread a needle, never calling herself a feminist, but making it clear that she believed that women could and must have it all. She, on the um, matter of the South. Oh, go ahead. No, please. No, I, I was interrupting you. Um, oh. And uh, I didn't want to be doing that. Um, I wanted, um, but I did want to come back to the, the question of race. Right. Um, in particular, because, um, you know, here, uh, LBJ helps to steer the 1964 Civil Rights Bill to passage, extremely important Civil Rights Act. And then in 65, the Voting Rights Act. Um, and um, she's all in. Um, and, you know, both of them demonstrating important commitments to racial advancement. And then um, as the 60s wears on, they're caught up in the maelstrom of a radicalizing um, uh, movement for racial equality of black power, black consciousness, and she's confronted by Eartha Kitt, uh, who she, you know, memorably invites to uh, one of her lunches. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can see the, the way in which the movement of the country and the times, the Johnsons are, are caught at a particular moment. I wonder if you could, I'm speaking to this. I want you to speak to it. Okay, okay. I'm doing too I, much talking. No, that's okay. I'll speak to the Eartha Kitt moment, but it comes in January of 68. So just to go slightly backwards for a minute sure. yes. and say that on race and on civil rights, you know, she had spent her summers growing up in Alabama, as she yes. said, just 20 miles from the Edmund Pettus Bridge. 
you know, if you can imagine the Atwaga County, I'm not pronouncing it with her Southern lilt, is right adjacent to where Harper Lee grew up. So Harper Lee, the, the, the South that Harper Lee depicts is the South that Lady Bird grows up in. She, for that reason, is intensely aware of the potential backlash among white Southerners around civil rights. She deeply understands the white supremacy of the South. And so until July of 64, when the first Civil Rights Act passes, she's careful about not active, not too explicitly promoting civil rights legislation. She promotes her husband, she promotes the New South, but she's, she feels a sense of trepidation, which was merited, of course. And later she goes after the law is passed to campaign all over the South to promote civil rights among the southern among southerners whom she relates to and she gets death threats for doing it so mm -hmm. she's she's a woman who i think understands what they what what the cost of keeping racial apartheid could be and what the consequence of leveling the racial playing field might be for the Democratic Party, as LBJ so clearly said right after the first law was passed. It'll lose the South for your generation and mine, he said to Bill Moyers. So those two pieces of legislation, plus the great society programs, when you think about the literacy programs and Medicare and Medicaid and the arts programs that were part of the great society, all of that had a civil rights component to it. It wasn't that it was that they did civil rights and then the rest of it was for white America. It was all about their fundamental idea that that government, it, that the role of government is to help lift and level the playing field. By 1968, Eartha Kitt comes to the White House and now we've had riots in American cities summer after summer. These are political uprisings that are challenging the lack of jobs, the lack of housing, the lack of green space, police brutality. They're not sort of just sort of chaotic, um, unsubstantive protests. There's a lot of content to them. They're called riots, but they're also political uprisings. And Lady Bird is taken aback by this, as is Lyndon. And they start to feel that their own progressive self, they don't recognize the country anymore. They don't really understand why all of this advancement has bred so much demands for more, so much anger. And Eartha Kitt comes to the White House for a luncheon, the title of which is Crime in Our Streets. And this is when Lyndon has just introduced a big crime bill in the night before it, his State of the Union address. And Eartha is invited because she's a civil rights activist and she's a huge star. She's on Batman, she's performed all over the world. She's Catwoman at this point. And she started to spend her money in Watts and in Anacostia on youth empowerment programs. She's testified in Congress. So she's invited to come and speak to talk about you know, what's bugging the youth these days, essentially. And she... Um, creates a bit of a firestorm, which then gets totally out of control because what she does is, you know, she, she's from the South too, and she challenges a Southern white lady in the White House, not so much over the crime bill per se, but what she does really for the first time that gets this kind of public and, and, and public rebuke by the White House is she connects the war in Vietnam to the war at home. Mm -hmm. And this is crossing a line. This is breaking protocol. You go to the White House, you speak to what you're invited to speak to. You don't dis upset the, the choreography the way Eartha did. Um, so the story in the book gets a whole chapter because the way it was subsequently reported, I think was wrong. The way the White House spun what happened creeps into Lady Bird's own rendition of what happened. And so I think it deserves some unpacking to show how spin machines and how a White House authorized spin machine totally destroyed Eartha Kitt's career actually for a couple of decades. And, th and then it's, it's, it's the lowest point that I found of Lady Bird's time in the White House. Well, it seemed as if initially, um, from your account, that um, 
you know, when Eartha Kitt gets up, she was invited, to, as she later pointed out, and invited to speak. Um, I guess Lady Bird took her time on calling on her, anticipating uh, from her earlier comment, the president had stopped in and Eartha kind of got warmed up with LBJ for a moment there in a question, but didn't get too far. Um, but then she um, she's talking about the juvenile delinquency and crime and um, say, Eartha Kitt saying, you know, um, these young, uh, young men who commit crimes know they're not gonna get sent to Vietnam. What's the motive to get an education when there are no jobs? What's the motive to stay good when you know, uh, you'd get drafted and sent to Vietnam? So it seemed as if the response to this, really a lot of it was driven by the war and the Johnson's increasing defensiveness about the war at that point in time. I think it was absolutely driven by the war. I mean, that's what she was doing. She was connecting what was happening at home with the anti-war movement in the country. And at that point in January of 68, Lady Bird, back to our discussion about her Vietnam, Vietnam blinders, she had begun to, to move on Vietnam in the sense that she found her environmental agenda being increasingly drowned out when she went to speak on college campuses and she no longer could avoid the really bad press and pretty vicious protests that had been largely aimed at her husband until then. And she had two daughters who were sending their own husbands off to Vietnam. Yes. And, and I think it was a turning point to her when she started meeting with wounded service people who were coming to the White House, who were quadriplegics and paraplegics. So she began to feel a little bit more connected to the tragedy of, of what Americans were experiencing when they came back by meeting them directly. And, and you're right, the, there were two things. One was that, that Eartha Kitt was challenging them on the war, but also that she was violating protocol. And I think there was a a racial component to this kind of, you know, how dare this woman come in and tell us on our home turf what we should do and think about a topic she wasn't even invited to come and speak to. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think um, it, I suppose like some component of this was just having it all arrive right in the White House, you know? I think uh, so and um, I, I think the confrontation so. that occurred there. Um, I was interested in, um, I mean, there's so much uh, to, to what you've done here, I think. Um, the, there are several questions that people have asked about um, civil rights. And I wondered whether in her entries, how much of it, how, how many asides? I mean, was there anything, hmm. you know, are we getting the real, are we getting her real response? Or are we getting the response that she wants recorded? Was there anything in which she says, well, this was a hellish day I had to deal with, you know, is there a formality to the, um, to the dictated remarks, Julia? Well, there's a formality, but there's also an openness. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's no doubt that she was, and an openness, by the way, that surprised me because my impression initially was that she was this stiff, controlled character. And she was very controlled and very compartmentalized. But, um, you know, listening to all of them and reading all, all of the transcripts, what I was surprised by the openness was how much she talked about how she felt. So when she was exhausted and when there was a bad day or her struggles with menopause and LBJ's moods and raising two teenage daughters in the White House. I mean, it's really in the totality all there, but it's all delivered in these kind of perfect sentences and word pictures and cogent paragraphs. So you can think that it's, and it is, it is, recorded for legacy. It is not a private diary. Right. It's a document meant to establish her, her role in this history very right. consciously. 
but she can't help but um, you know she's dropping there's no way that she could have known then the bombshells that she was dropping from the standpoint of historians looking back on on what happened afterwards and um, what we learn about the inside uh, the inside uh, events. Well, well, that's that's a really interesting point. She couldn't have known she was dropping bombshells. They feel like bombshells to us because they haven't been reported because her diaries haven't been included in the accounts of the LBJ presidency. Um, they should have been. So they're bombshells because there's this huge body of material that's been written already. And this seems to be totally new. Um, right. On the Huntland strategy memo, by the way, LBJ reproduces the entire thing in his memoir. Yes. Which, of course, you know, historians and presidential memoirs, they're not, they, you know, you use them for references, you don't use them as gospel. But I thought it was interesting that, or one does, I thought it was interesting that LBJ was among the only people to credit her for that strategy. Just takes time for it all to shake out, though. Someone has asked about Caro's portrayal of their marriage versus what you have um, discerned from, from your research. Um, you do mention that, um, you know, sh you believe that she was well aware of his philandering. Yes. Uh, even to the degree of having one of his paramours who stayed over in the White House and had breakfast <laughs> with, with the three of them had breakfast the following day. She was not, uh, obviously she was there as a guest for the evening, but there was a history. Um, and um, Bird wakes up and she's wearing Lady Bird's robe. <laughs> right. Um, what do you make of what, what's your view of the marriage? Look, you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation or somewhat toward the beginning, that uh, notion of there being totally intermingled, intertwined. That wasn't my phrase, that was hers. She in 97 cut off ties with another biographer and she wrote to that biographer, you'll never understand either of us if you don't understand how totally intertwined we are with one another's lives. And I took that as my cue really to think about the layers and complexity, well, of her marriage, but of any marriage of that length. They had been married for 30 years when they get into the White House. And um, of course, I mean, I'm not dismissing the infidelities or the philandering and the vulgarity, but I think that the focus on those things, which certainly comes out in Caro, to the exclusion of, winds up diminishing her agency and depriving her of substance. And we lose the full picture if that's all we focus on. I think she of all people would have said, there's more to us and more to me than being um, the victim of, of his philandering. And treating her as victim is something that I really try to avoid. The Caro depiction you know, his book goes till July, his fourth volume goes until July of 1964. So I haven't seen whether that's, whether the way the marriage evolved is reflected in, in the way he's gonna treat the presidency. Would you, um, did you see, was there any hint, any reference to these infidelities by her uh, anywhere in, in the diaries, any hint of it? Well, only in that reference to, and the person that she was talking about is Helen Gahagan Douglas, who's right. a very interesting yes. character in American history too. She was a very successful actress who then ran for Congress very close to the Roosevelt's. And when she and Lyndon were in the House of Representatives, they had a pretty open affair in Washington, DC. Um, he defended her when Richard Nixon red baited her when she was running again, I believe for the Senate in the 1950s and LBJ was in the Senate at the time. Um, and Helen Gahagan Douglas was gorgeous and she was intelligent. And when Lady Bird includes this whole story about how much she revered a former lover of 
Lindens, who was in the White House. On We've lost your morning. audio for a second here, oh. Julia. Oh, no. Okay. But I'm hoping Am I that back? the little elves at the Kennedy Library are going to rescue us. Am I us. back? Want to try again? Can you hear me now? Yes. Shoot. Am I back? You are. Yep. Oh, good. So I don't know where I left off, but where I what I was saying was that the only place in the diaries where she talks about it is this encounter and the morning she spends, she describes reverentially her morning with Helen Gahagan Douglas. It's a little surprising to say the least, but I think she compartmentalized and there were some of his affairs, some of the women whom she recognized and some that she just ignored. How about, um, let's talk a little bit about her as a mom. Okay. Um, she had two daughters and uh, it sounded as if um, as their, the, what, the Johnson's White House years came to a close, they, they actually were, she in some ways became even more engaged with her daughters uh, as, you know, um, the responsibilities, you know, of the public life uh, declined. There were the um, memorable White House weddings with really my laugh out loud moment in reading your book uh, when you quote uh, the comedian Edie Adams saying uh, there was all this, you know, it was like a royal wedding and all this national attention and press focused on the first one. And uh, Adam saying, no one was invited to the wedding except the immediate country. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great line. Uh, but it sounded in some sense as if um, she was somewhat, you know, uh, uh, a hands-off mother um, and became more of more engaged um, as time went on, or, or is that not correct? Well, no, I think that the, Sometimes I thought of the Obamas and how Michelle Obama would talk about how great it was to finally have everyone under one roof yes. when they were in the White House. And there was a lot of that because after the JFK assassination, Linda left UT. She moved into the White House. She went to George Washington. Lucy was at, um, she was still in high school. And there was a lot of time when the whole family was there. Lady Bird's diaries are filled with her delight at having much more time with the girls than she had when at earlier times. I think there was a lot of many, many years when she was out many nights each week doing politics with Lyndon, the social scene in Washington. And if you're in a, a political spouse was unrelenting and she felt and the kids were raised by nannies. And it was not until the White House years where Lady, my take is Lady Bird was able to connect with her daughters more intimately in a more sustained way and then those weddings yes which were amazing something that would never happen today right 700 people for one and 600 for the other i think one of our uh, guests once <clears throat> is asking um what you think her most satisfying accomplishment was during her white house years do you have a mm. sense of that? My, my, my quick answer to that might not be the one that focuses on the substance of her environmental agenda. It might be getting LBJ out alive. Yeah. It might be actually succeeding in having him not run for a second term. And well, of that... course the tragedy of that is that he died four years after they left the White House. That, uh, that indeed is a, a remarkable part of your story when, you know, I, I was very struck in reading your book at um, the way in which the war becomes, uh, you know, there are so the high ideals of both Johnsons and the true progress that was made, um, you know, every, I think historians and others who study this period, who read about it, those Americans who lived through it, well aware of it, the way that the war came to overshadow uh, his presidency, you feel as you move through your book, the gathering storm. And um, 
the uh, exit that she and he discussed early on, um, really, uh, it, it seemed at the State of the Union, even before um, March, he was talking then about, um, you know, saying then that he was going to, to uh, end his presidency, would well, not run. That's true. They start to really plot the timing and the substance of his announcement beginning in the fall of 1967. It's actually really tied for her to her confronting the protest movement around the war when she goes to New England to inaugurate a couple of environmental studies programs at Williams College and at Yale. Yes. And she can't, ha she's not heard. The protests are totally drown it out. So they start planning it in the fall of 67, even before the Tet Offensive, which comes at the end of January of 68, after that State of the Union. But there's this, another funny story in there is the dynamic between the two of them around that, that State of the Union where and is written and he's, it's not going on the teleprompter and he puts it in his pocket and then she realizes that he's changed his suit and it's not in his pocket and she goes to the Oval Office to get him out of a meeting um, and they stand and he commiserates once again, should I do it, should I not do it? You know, he's, he's very Hamlet about this choice yes. and, um, and winds up in January of 68 basking in the applause around his crime bill, which of course is another element of defeat in a way, right? He's, he's pushing law and order as opposed to progress on civil rights and doesn't announce that he's not gonna run again. And she, um, what I was not able to find out was really how she felt about that. There's not in her diary a post-mortem on his failure to read the statement, just the fact that he didn't read the statement. And then she spends Jan the first quarter of 1968 just adamantly pushing them to get there and to get it done and to choose a date and to do it. Yes, I think you suggest that she was a little bit down after the State of the Union or, you know, there was some, you know, that, that was a really interesting discussion, I thought. Uh, it seems to me, you know, as I'm listening to you and having uh, read what you had to say, it's uh, so striking that <clears throat> although the book is about Lady Bird, and I can't imagine anyone uh, improving upon our understanding beyond what you've done here of this woman, that it really, she was right when she talked about this initial point we discussed that you can't really get one without a, you know, understand one without understanding the other because he's a, obviously it's his presidency that drives this story, but, um, and she's the subject, but he emerges in this book. We learned so much about him, I think, um, in the refraction of, you know, this lens that uh, the the refracted light. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm probably using the wrong metaphor. I'm mixing up my optics, but um, you know, it you really it is so illuminating of his presidency um, by having her voice in there. It's really very interesting, and I wonder. For some reason, I don't think that would necessarily be true of every. President and First Lady story? Well, I'm not a First Lady historian. Nor I am mean, I. I <laughs> you know, and I, I feel like you're correct that it, it isn't necessarily true of each presidential couple. But what she did, and I wish everybody would do, is kept that record so that we could put her into the room and really tease out where one stopped and the other started and where were the issues on which she was present or wasn't present. You know, back to Michelle Obama for a second. In her memoir, she says, and it surprised me that there was only one time in the two terms Barack Obama was in the White House when he asked her to come to the Oval Office during work hours. And that was on the day of the Sandy Hook mass shooting in Connecticut. 
in 2013. Mm -hmm. Lady Bird Johnson was in the Oval Office every day. I mean, I might be somewhat exaggerating, but all the time they were communicating and working together constantly. She knit together the operations of the East Wing and the West Wing into a joint political operation. And she and LBJ and very important character in the story, Liz Carpenter did it. But I, I don't know that other White Houses were that commingled as these two were. Well, we've just had a question, a wonderful question from somebody asking about um, who is struck by, how, uh, by Lady Bird and Eleanor Roosevelt, um, both policy and emotional confidants and advisors to their extremely powerful husbands, each critical of the emotional and mental well being of their husbands, their philandering husbands, and they both achieved much of their own personal and political agencies through their role as First Lady. They pushed their husbands left. Um, and when uh, neither would have uh, particularly gone there, absent the rationale, absent the rationale in the counsel of their wives, that was, I thought, a stunner about birth control and um, her um, standing behind widened access to birth control and LBJ right there alongside making this a, a policy issue. That was a super interesting discussion. So the um, guest is asking about your thoughts on the similarity between the Roosevelts and the Johnsons. I couldn't say it better than the guest did. <laughs> yes. I thought that that was a perfect synopsis. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know that Lady Bird pushed uh, LBJ to the left. Like there I'm not, I think that they were pretty much on the same page in terms of uh, the civil rights agenda, at least. I think she certainly, as far as environmental policy with her partnership with Stu Udall, the Secretary of Interior, absolutely mm -hmm. did help Udall and Udall helped her to, to move LBJ along until the very end on the environment. And, and of course, Lady Bird and LBJ knew the Roosevelts. They were, when they came into the White House, devout New Deal Democrats. And they believed that it was their job to push forward with what the Roosevelts had started. Um, and Lady Bird had attended lunches at the White House. Liz Carpenter was a cub reporter who had covered Eleanor at those teas that she used to convene with female uh, journalists. They really felt very much to be descendants of, of the Roosevelts, even though Lady Bird's um, style was quite different you know she was from the south and she was not as active in terms of her public voice as as Eleanor was she didn't have a weekly radio show she didn't have a column you know Eleanor was way more out there in many ways but Lady Bird found her own way and saw Eleanor as a model too explicitly so yes it's 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 fascinating because you know uh LBJ, you know, once referred at least once to uh, FDR as his political daddy. So, um, you know, they were certainly reared in this, uh, the New Deal liberalism uh, yes. was very influential. And if I can just say, um, I, I produced this podcast, which came out at the same time. So I was doing more research in the audio archive. And uh, there's this moment in 1965 when the president of ABC News calls LBJ and he wants to ask LBJ for permission to work with Lady Bird on a documentary about beautification in Washington, DC. And LBJ says to him, uh, you don't need to be asking me about that. I'm like Mr. Roosevelt. I let her do whatever she wants to do. I don't get in her way. Well, and uh you know, her contributions were really interesting. I continued to, I felt as I, I really paused um, on the fact that she mentioned that two thirds, at one point, two thirds of her conversations with Lyndon were about the Vietnam War. And that was in and, 1966. Yes, and that, despite the fact um, that, um, you know, before a single, a uh, detachment of combat troops arrive, um, he 
he's getting all this advice. We've gone over this from the Kennedy holdovers. Uh, but you have George Ball, the Under Secretary of State, warning the war is unwinnable and could result eventually in 50,000 American soldiers dead. That was a that was a moment reading that you know that that there was an understanding prior to the escalation of right. this and um you know this is um you wonder whether had she pivoted earlier you know unlikely i would say that she would have made uh that it would have made much of a difference in his thinking but i don't know but if you just allow me because i know that you don't all of you that are here have the book but um i hope you will read the book but I wanna just read a short thing that she said about Vietnam in May of 1977 at the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. which gives a... Just as sorry just as strained, just as ripped, and not knowing the answer, but feeling this country had to live up to its commitment. It was extremely painful, of course, because he could not find an honorable way to end that war, and he wanted this country to be united. So of course, it was a very eroding, wearing, painful period. And I think that says it all. That's yeah. what they were talking about. That's what they were coping with. Well, and of course, we know as historians or students of history, the long prehistory um, that set that set the nation on this path that was there before Lyndon Johnson ever became president of the United Correct. States. But obviously, um, you know, he has a pivotal role in that. Well, this is um, Julia. This was a, this is a really amazing book. I feel that. Well, thank you, Ellen. You did something extremely important here, and uh, it's also just a wonderfully engaging read. You're a, a very, very uh, skilled writer, and uh, you've got a great story to tell, and you've made some important history in telling it. So it's been a great pleasure to talk with you about this book, and I hope our viewers or our guests here tonight will, will follow up and uh, read it read your book. It's, it, it uh, pays dividends. It's wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm just honored to be here with you. And, and I thought you covered so much ground and I, it was a really delightful conversation for me to have the chance to participate in. Thank you. Okay. I think that probably does it. We've uh, run out of time. Um, and uh, thank you to the Kennedy Library for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. I would have loved to have had it with you anyway, but nice to have others joining us and uh, thank uh, the guests uh, as well for their interesting questions, which I did kind of work in um, to uh, many of them overlapped with my own. So very good. Fantastic, okay. thank you. Good night, All everybody. Right. Good night. Bye.